Bravo. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Nice Wonder of the Now Man Show, and I'm here with Mike Garson. He's a keyboardist, pianist, composer. He's collaborated and been a sideman with a diversity of artists such as David Bowie, Stanley Clark, and Nine Inch Nails. In this episode, we're going to be talking about his music, including his collaborations and even the creative process. Mike Garson, thank you for being on the Now Man Show. My pleasure. Now, how, when did you first discover music? There was music in my house in Brooklyn, so I think I started hearing it four, five, six years old. My mom played, my dad played, my sister played. <clears throat> and then uh, somewhere around seven, I started piano lessons and uh, never looked back. So you studied at the Brooklyn School of Music? I went to Brooklyn College, which is just a normal uh, university. Um, but most of my great piano studies were with great private teachers, really good private teachers. So, uh, what are th some of those teachers that... <laughs> Leonard Eisner, he was a Juilliard wow. uh, teacher, but he happened to be a neighbor, so it saved me the trip from Brooklyn to Manhattan. <laughs> and. Um, Lenny Tristano was a very famous jazz teacher who was blind, who played with Charlie Parker. I studied with him three years. Hall Overton uh, did Thelonious Monk ar arrangements for a town hall album that was done in 1965 around there. So I got to learn a lot of monk music when I was n younger in, in the 60s. Um, my first teacher was the most inspiring one. His name was Mr. Scatura because he just would play for me at the end of each lesson. And that's how I really learn music, by hearing. It's hard to uh, put music in, in, in words. So he was great. So I, w I was blessed. I just had great teachers. I actually had a few lessons with Herbie Hancock, and I had one six-hour lesson with Bill Evans. Wow. You know, these guys were very accessible. I'd go see them in jazz clubs and... <clears throat> go up to them and say, can you give me a lesson? Bill Evans said, come over to my house and never charge me a penny. Wow, that's absolutely fantastic. So your family were classical musicians, would you say? Or? My mom played classical, my sister played classical, my dad played by ear. He, wow. he, he grew up in the, he was born in 1906, so he was hearing uh, the early silent films and was cowboy music. So he had just a great ear. He couldn't read. He never took a lesson. He actually wrote a cowboy piece that sounded like this. The melody's in the left hand. I mean, it's just amazing how he came up with that. And he taught it to me when I was 12 or 13. For five years, I'm studying all this piano playing, and I couldn't do what he did by ear. So I think I got a lot from him. That's amazing. Um, what what was the first piece of music that really inspired you, would you say? Um, I think when I was 11, I learned uh, Fair Elise, this one. But then I also learned the Moonlight Sonata. When I was 12, my mother offered me $15, which was a lot then, yeah. to learn uh, Liszt Hungarian Rhapsody oh, wow. number two, this one. So I learned that. It made 15 bucks. I played it very sloppy, but at least I learned it. And I think the first time I heard that was in a Bugs Bunny cartoon or something. That's right. They're doing this. <laughs> that, yeah. Those guys knew what to use in those cartoons. And some of the great composers were... Um, they wrote for cartoon. I knew some of those people. They were much older when I got to meet them in the 20s and 30s, and when I was 20 or 30 years old, but they were 70 or 80 then, and they wrote great music. When you're writing for cartoons, you, you know, you're, you're all over the place. So, so, you know, exactly. <clears throat> that kind of thing. So, so your music developed and, and evolved over time. What, what uh, after classical, where did you go from there? So I played classical from 7 to 14, then I heard Errol Garner, Dave Brubeck, Andre Previn, and uh, 1960, I think I was 15, I heard uh, the Brubeck thing. And that was uh, 
in 9-8, and it was interesting that it went back from 9-8 to 4-4 mm -hmm. in the middle, and it mixed classical and jazz, and I, I liked that. Yeah. And then I heard uh, Errol Garner playing things like the... <laughs> and I loved that. <clears throat> so I think I realized I was meant to be an improviser. And my Juilliard teacher, who was teaching me Mozart, like this... teaching me that and then he'd come in and I'm doing and he he, he didn't get it <laughs> he said I had delusions of grandeur now maybe he was right but it didn't matter because I was hearing things in my head so that was my last lesson with him uh, so uh, there was this band brethren was that your first band that was my first rock band no my first band was a jazz band with Dave Liebman who's played with Miles Davis, that was called the Impromptu Quartet. That was when I was 14. Wow. And we, we used to play weddings and bar mitzvahs and little jazz gigs. We had Larry Coriel in the band and Randy Brecker, and we had um, um, Bob Moses on drums, and we had a band. But then when I was maybe in my 20s, the first rock band that I got called to tour with was Brethren. The drummer in that band was Rick Murata, Oh. who was a great drummer, played with Roberta Flack, and he, he wrote the theme for Raymond. He's a drummer, he's made a lot of money doing that. Oh, wow. So he was a gr great drummer, and we had a great quartet, but the singer was a great singer, but sounded a little too much like Stevie Winwood, so we were like traffic a little bit. We used to open for Joe Cocker and Leon Russell, and um, <clears throat> um, Jesus, maybe 20 other different bands over a period of a year or two, and... Uh, <clears throat> but the band never made it. We had a great manager with named Sid Bernstein who passed a few years ago. He he brought the Beatles to Shea Stadium. Wow. So he loved us. He, they thought we were going to be the next Beatles. I didn't. Oh, really? So I did that for a, f a year or two, and then uh, it fell apart. Uh, I, I actually fulfilled the place of Dr. John. He did the first album with Brethren, and I did the wow. second. We never met, but I always loved his playing. Mm. <clears throat> and um, then um, when that was over... I was playing jazz again. I worked with Elvin Jones at uh, a little jazz club in the village called Pookie's Pub. It was across the street from uh, the Half Note, uh, which was on Spring and Hudson. And I went in to see Elvin, who was Coltrane's drummer. Coltrane had died a year earlier. He had a great band. I knew the sax player in the band and the bass player. And the piano player fell off the piano, drunk. Oh, wow. And they dragged him out onto the street. And Elvin got on the microphone and he says, there's a piano player here. And I raised my hand. <laughs> and I was dressed sort of in a tuxedo and I had just come from a few days earlier seeing Arthur Rubenstein. And just psychically, he just says, come on up here, Arthur Rubenstein. Wow. And, and I went up and played for three days with him and he paid me. And it was my greatest musical experience because he was so great as a drummer that my playing went from a scale, let's say on a scale one to 10, if I was at six, I was eight. By the time I finished working with him three days later, just playing two or three sets a night, they were six-hour gigs in those days. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Then you met uh, Annette Peacock? Annette Peacock um, was an avant-garde singer. She had been married to Paul Blay, who recently passed, sadly, and Gary Peacock, the great bassist who worked with uh, Keith Jarrett. And then um, she herself was an avant-garde singer and composer. Bowie happened to know her. I played on her album called I'm the One. Mm -hmm. I got to play a little avant-garde playing on that. When Bowie came to America for his first American tour with uh, Spiders from Mars, he didn't have a pianist. So he ran into her. He asked her, do you know somebody? She recommended me. And they hired me for eight weeks, and they never were able to quite get rid of me because I did his first American <laughs> tour. And then I did his last concert in 2006, which is crazy, with probably 400 concerts in between and maybe uh, 18 albums or something like that. That's fantastic. We're going to do another episode to totally pay tribute to David he Bowie. It. He deserves it. Fantastic. Um, can you play? Uh, you, now you, you have some solo albums, too, um, well, that you've done. I 15 solo albums, most of them. You know, solo jazz albums or classical albums, if you sell 5,000 or one or two, you're doing good. I did one jazz album with Stanley Clark, probably sold 50,000, but they're always small. 
Um, but they're around, and eventually I'll put them all up on YouTube. Um, what were you thinking? Oh, that's a good question. I'm going to leave that up to you. To do, do you have a favorite piece? Well, the first thing I played was a total improvisation. Yeah. I happen to like that one because I'm good for one out of ten or one out of five. That one felt very good. It had some impressionist elements, which I haven't touched on for a while. So I enjoyed that one. <clears throat> I could play... Um, well, do you want to hear some jazz or or classical piece made up? Do you have a preference? Um, no preference. I'll leave that up to you. Be spontaneous in the moment. Well, let's see what happens. Then I'll tell you what I played after if it, if it happens to be a song. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. Fantastic. What would you call that? That's called Stella by Starlight. It's an old standard that was in a ghost movie back in the 50s or 40s. <laughs> but it's an old just standard that pianists play and singers sing. But it was my variations on it. That's fantastic. You. Um, now, you have collaborated with a lot of different people, a lot of different styles of music. Um, Give us a, the names of some of those people, so the it's audience. From the sublime to the ridiculous, <laughs> you know, I played with uh, Mike Brecker, Freddie Hubbard, Stan Getz, Dave Liebman, uh, Elvin Jones, 
um, Lee Konitz, Jimmy Garrison, Eddie Gomez, Charlie Hayden, Nancy Wilson. Then you, that's all jazz people. Then you switch over. Well, I in the rock pop thing. I work with Martha Reeves from Martha and the Vandellas. I work with that group Brethren, and then. I worked with, of course, David Bowie, who was the longest standing member, but I also worked with uh, Smashing Pumpkins. I did one of their, several of their tours. And uh, I did the movie Stigmata with Billy Corgan, who was leader of Smashing Pumpkins. I did uh, the Fragile album with Trent Reznor from uh, Nine Inch Nails. I played on uh, Return to Saturn, a bonus track with Gwen Stefani. I uh, played with a wild band called the Dylan's Escape Plan. They're wild. And uh, a tune called The Widower was wonderful. I mean, it's still going. I get calls from a lot of unknown but very talented people all around the world. And I'm able to do the music in my studio here. And uh, so um, it so, goes on and on. I probably forgot 50 of them right now. Yeah. but. That gives you a, a, a rough idea. And Ava Cherry, I think. I worked with her with yeah. David Bowie for sure. Yeah. She was a singer, Luther Vandross, who was in the Mike Garson band when we opened for David Bowie. So was Dave Sanborn on alto sax. He was amazing. And um, Dennis Davis played drums. I mean, we had just tremendous band. Michael Kamen, who passed several years ago, was a great film composer, but he was the music director on one of the Bowie tours. And a uh, very talented guy been very blessed it's still going you know I, yeah. I get the wildest calls out of nowhere and even played some country music for someone a few weeks ago who's a <laughs> singer songwriter got to use my floyd kramer licks so. <laughs> so i get to do that and uh <clears throat> probably forgetting kuta Yes, he's a French uh, French artist, very talented, had a lovely voice, influenced by Bowie. And Hote, uh, who is a Japanese artist. Um, Jesus, I'm, I'm forgetting. Chris McKay and his Critical Thinking. That's another group I played with them. They're like an Athens, Georgia group, right? Yeah, I played with them. And uh, who else? Sleepyard. Did that. These are some of the ones that are a little less known, but they had something to say musically, yeah, you know? Yeah. And it, it's endless. I just got a call. I'm going to do a session next month with a uh, guy who was from uh, Martin Nobles or something like that. He played with Porno for Pyros or oh, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. And, that's that's uh, uh, Perry Farrell. <laughs> Perry Farrell's band was Porno for Pyros. Oh, see, so this was the bassist, and yeah. now he's got some things, so I'm going to do some stuff with him. Um, the craziest thing is I did the Liberace TV movie. <laughs> you did? And I played all the piano parts after he passed. This is back in 80. It was an ABC special of the week, so I had to learn all things that he did. Claire de Lune and Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto. And um, that was a very humbling period because I always thought of him as more commercial. And I wasn't a big fan of his as a jazz musician. But when I grew up as a kid at seven, eight, nine years old, he had a TV show. And I would see it in the afternoon at 1 p.m. And he was actually great, and I liked him then. So it was only when I got the jazz mentality that I dismissed him. But when I had to learn his music, it was very humbling because it was hard. Yeah, exactly. He was a great entertainer, too. And see, that, that's where, we, where some people get distracted, is that they can be a great artist and, and musician, but they have to entertain. That's their job. Well, he certainly influenced Elton John and Bowie. Mm -hmm. He was the highest paid act in Vegas when I was working there back in the 70s. Phenomenal. And there's uh, also a uh, photographer, Alex Boyd. Who, who is this guy? He's a lovely guy. He's a very good photographer. He, he um, just called me. He was a big Pumpkins fan. He called me 10, 15 years ago, and he asked if he could create uh, a MySpace site for me. And he just helped me. Uh, he asked me to write electronic music and other kinds of music, and he used to put it up for me. I knew nothing about you know, this is pre-Facebook, that whole world, and uh, he was very helpful. But he's also talented in his own right as a photographer. And you worked on with him on a film project? I think I did something with him on that. I mean, you, you know more about me now than I do, so this is very, <laughs> very good. So, um, now uh, let's, let's bring it up to date. Uh, I would like to talk about 
the creative process when we wrap this up, but um, you were commissioned in 2014 to do a piece with a, a brain surgeon. Yes. Um, over the last 20 years, I had been fooling around with what I thought could be the healing effects of music. I mean, I'm not reinventing the wheel. Music does make you feel better. But I started to go in a little more detail and I connected with this brain surgeon. I wanted to be a doctor when I was a kid. Oh, really? He was a pianist, so we wanted to switch roles. <laughs> <laughs> I told him not to give up his day gig. Yeah. But he also uh, told me, don't study those books, you know, stay with the piano. So I told him, uh, you know, I had this idea of a healing suite, a symphonic piece with hundred people on stage, children's choir, jazz musicians, opera singers, yeah. pop people. And he got interested in it. So he said, give me 30 pieces and I'll test it out on a hundred patients. They chose their favorite 12. So the things they chose were obviously calmer, quieter, more melodic. And I developed this whole suite based on some beautiful music. And we performed the debut of it uh, two years ago in, uh, or a year and a half ago, at Segerstrom Hall, a gorgeous hall in Orange County, 1,700 people was packed. And now I'll be doing that with other symphonies around the world over the next five years. Plus, uh, my next work, I'm gonna write a piece um, regarding autism, and I have children with autism will be um, on stage performing with me. Uh, my grandson is 12, he has autism, and he's a very good pianist. Wow. Yeah, so I'm learning a lot. I'm also working with Vanderbilt University, doing some studies with autistic children where they're testing some of my music out and see how it affects the brain. Because they think there's some synchronization that's off between their eyes and their ear, and they're hoping that my music or other music, whatever, tends to um, bring that together. So I'm very interested in, in that, and... Uh, very dedicated to us. I believe that'll probably be half of the things I do. It was 70% now with David's passing, there's gonna be a lot of Bowie tributes, so I'll be doing both. There's a couple um, <clears throat> quotes that were on your website that I thought were interesting. Um, embracing the idea of the Renaissance man, Mike continually experiments with new ways through which he can communicate his humanistic ideals and hopes for the world in which he lives. Sounds good on paper. <laughs> um, you know, I, I believe that who you are and who your music are one and the same at a certain point, and if you keep developing it in your own voice, I know Bowie was definitely on page with me with that. I, I believe that <clears throat> you could express a lot that you can't say in words. So um, I just like the fact of music not only healing physically, but mentally and spiritually, preventive medicine. It makes for good transitions before a person dies, hearing some calm, beautiful music, be it Bach or Beethoven, Chopin, some of the things I've been writing lately. So um, I don't know what to say about that, you know. That's, that says it all. And the, this last quote, which is relevant to uh, the Now Man show, I would say. Um, well, my music is called Now Music. Yes. So I could relate to that because I compose it in the moment. You certainly do, and that's uh, that's fantastic. No artistic medium is off limits to this avant-garde individual to whom the word no is quickly transformed into the word now. That's interesting. Well, you know, I realize at a certain point if you could express how you feel in any given second, there's no higher form of music. Mind you, if you haven't done your homework, I'd rather hear a great composition, but if you're in rare form, an improv can be um, superior. At least that's my reality. Mike, this was fantastic. Uh, when people want to learn more about your music, what, what is a website they can go to or websites? MikeArson.com. Mike there's my official Facebook. There's all sorts of things I'm always posting. There's a YouTube channel I have. So, you know. I'm at Mike Arson at Gmail. People write me at dot gmail dot com. People write me there, but um, my website is great, and the Facebook. Um, my assistant uh, Mark does an amazing job of keeping that, so they could find me that way. That's fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for being on the Now Man Show. My pleasure. I'll be I'll be back. <laughs> excellent, excellent. This is nice wonder for the Now Man Show. <laughs>